our eternal destiny hangs on that one question. What child is this? Now, there's a lot of great Christmas carols. I like dissecting them. I like going through them. I try to do at least one every year uh, of going through that because they're, they're just great. Uh, I like thinking through, just like we like with any songs, contemporary songs today, you wonder, what do they mean by that? You know, and, and so it is our last song, by the way, and so this will be leading towards that. And we're actually going to be, um, we're going to be kind of looking at three parts. And that third part is going to actually look at the, uh, the Christmas carol itself and to make sure that we have it in our heads of what we're, what we're saying. And then when we sing it together, hopefully it'll be, because a lot of times we do it, something's got a, you know, a good beat and, you know, it's catchy or whatever else. And we know the phrase or the chorus that, you know, but I, I don't know, the Christmas carols are, they're usually pretty incredible and pretty deep. Matter of fact, the one we were, um, the one we were just talking about, Romolo, uh, the one where a king's manger throne, how, how does that go, that, that phrase? Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, king, uh, the, the, the What's the phrase? Manger throne. Okay. Uh, what, you're talking about the lyrics? <laughs> just, yeah, just that one, that one phrase right there that has... Thank you. The king who reigns on a manger throne. I couldn't pull it back up and neither could you, but thank you. <laughs> no, it, I thought it was interesting because this, this Christmas carol, oh, What Child Is This, actually came from a poem and it was close to that phrase. So I don't know where they got that song. It started me me think, think and wonder where you got that song from. But it was a phrase out of that about this, uh, this manger would be this king's throne, and which is just an interesting concept. But anyways, that's what he was thinking. So some believe... He, being Jesus, was simply a great man, a moral teacher, a messenger of God. But as believers, we know the right answer. Jesus is the Son of God. And so we worship one God who has revealed himself in three persons. We know that, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we know that Jesus Christ is not only the Son of God, but he is God the Son. John 1 Verse 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I always wonder about that because I always tell new believers, you should start off in John, but the first half of the first chapter is pretty tough. As you're looking at it going, uh, 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 you're kind of looking at it going, wait, what just happened there? But as soon as you get down to verse 14 and realize and Jesus is that word, then you can go back and put his kind of name in the blank and it makes a little sense as you get a little bit further down, but it does kind of start a little awkward in that way. I like this, uh, C.S. Lewis gave this quote, a stable once had something inside of it that was bigger than our whole world, and it's just kind of fun to, uh, to think about. But I thought before we answer the question, what child is this, I thought we would look at whose child is this, and actually there's three answers to this, and so we'll take the first one. First of all, it's Joseph's child, and so I'm going to really be in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through uh, 24, and, but I will have them up uh, here in front so you can be uh, um, following along with that or with your uh, scriptures, but it'll mostly be a study out of Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 24. So Matthew's gospel starts with Jesus's foster father's genealogy. And so it's Joseph's genealogy in Matthew 1. It's Mary's genealogy in Luke chapter 3. And so with that, we see that these two lines cross at Mary and Joseph to bring this Christ child. And so Matthew starts his gospel by saying Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne of Israel, tracing really his legal right to the throne. And so it's, uh, we see the, the scripture, the, it, it, Matthew 1, the whole thing starts off with just this one sentence, and there's so much packed into this first sentence of that, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. He's actually saying a lot. Luke is, as he's writing this down for Theophilus, and he's writing this, and, and so he's, Jesus has that rightful place here in, racially through Abraham, Abraham's seed would be blessed. That was God's promise through Abraham, your seed would be blessed. And ultimately that he was going to bring Messiah into the world. But also royalty, uh, or excuse me, royally, and so racially and royally through David. 
David couldn't build a house for God, talking about the, the temple. His son Solomon would actually build the temple, right? He couldn't build a house, but God would build a house through him, metaphorically speaking, and it talks about in 2 Samuel seven thirteen, and that was talking about out of your lineage, David would become the son of David, which would be Jesus, and so racially and royally. And so Matthew, writing to the Jews, traces only back the genealogy from Jesus back to Abraham, which is kind of interesting. But in Luke's gospel, as he's writing to the Gentiles, not the Jews, he takes it all the way back. He's going to cover all of humanity and take it literally all the way back to Abraham. And so we have a lot of generations between Abraham and all the way back to Adam. And so that's what he covers. And so Luke's account, as I said, Mary's line, uh, in Luke 3.23, traces Jesus' natural physical rights to the throne. And so a lot happening. You and I, we hit the genealogy and go... I don't even know how to pronounce half of these names, right? And, but, you know, and so it's kind of like whatever. But, but with that, there's, there's a lot of in, importance behind that. All Jewish genealogies, Jewish, ge, Jewish genealogies were always so important all the way back from Genesis, right? But in AD 70, all the Jewish genealogies go away. They actually burnt them and they were completely gone after that time. The reason I say that or why that, I think that's important is because there is no Jew today who can claim with certainty and authority to be the son of Abraham and the son of David, except Jesus. And so after that, and so that's obviously, you know, uh, close to, you know, um, you know, the first century, probably it was about four BC, but all that to say it was in AD 70, there's, there, there's, no, there's no record after that, that point. Joseph, let's think about him a little bit because I think he kind of gets a, a bum deal in all of this. Um, think of him as a foster dad. So a lot of times we, and even scripture says, you know, in, uh, in Mary's again, in Luke chapter three, in her genealogy there, it doesn't use Mary's name as it usually didn't use women. There's a couple in Matthew's account, but it wasn't the norm. And so it talks about uh, being the son of, and then it names Mary's dad, was actually Joseph, which was like a, what we would say today, a son-in-law. And so it was connected in that way. But uh, it says who was supposed to be Jesus's father. So it even kind of brings it out there. But I want to say he was. He was, in a sense, and we have to explain that, but obviously we know he wasn't, um, he didn't, uh, you know, have relations with Mary in that way, but he was his foster's dad for sure. He was Jesus' real dad, and I want you to think it through that way. See, often somebody will ask a foster dad or an adoptive dad, a dad that's adopted children, uh, maybe sometimes ask them about, well, tell me about the real dad, meaning the biological dad, Right? Uh, but with that, that that's got to feel a little bit, it's like, wait a minute, I've raised this child since they're a baby, I'm the dad, you know, right? And so with that, think of it kind of from that side, and I just ask the question, did Joseph struggle with parental identity? Because I know parents do that have fostered and adopted, so they get to an age, I really want to know who my bi biological mother or father is, and, and those discussions that take place within the family, and, and it's part of that, and it's part of what happens, but I just wonder from Joseph's standpoint how that was. And so though he wasn't Jesus' biological dad, he was his dad, any different from embryo adoption today, which is getting more and more popularized and, and uh, happening a lot more. Matter of fact, did you know more than a million unused IVF, the in vitro fertilization embryos, are in uh, cryo storage right now? And here's the question, are they the next pro-life frontier? You have all of these babies frozen in time. Something to think about. Here's my question for you. What do we know about Jesus' foster dad? Let's look at, look at Matthew uh, 1, 19. I put it up on the top right of the screen. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. What do we know about Joseph? We don't know a whole lot about him, but what do we learn even from just, just this one verse right here? Just put up your hand and, and what, do, what do we learn? What's another way of saying that maybe? Anybody? Yeah. I'm sorry? Well, that, that, uh, it, it seems like that, and that's probably what the whole entire town thinks, but Joseph being a good guy, what, what, do, we, what do we see about Joseph's character in this? Yeah. Uh, he's forgiving. Okay, that he's forgiving, doesn't understand it, can't understand all that's going on, but 
What else? I think there's another hand in the very back. Was there? Yeah. Okay, but good, honest man, man with character, cares about his wife. Yeah, in the very back, right before you. Okay, good. We'd call him a stand-up guy to be able to do that because I'm going to get to a verse in a minute, what should have taken place, and he's a really stand-up guy, of what he could do. Because as you, as you had mentioned, I think that's a really great point there also. Um, I forget how you said it exactly, but he, uh, he would feel like a fool. It would be better if it would come out that, you know, if he did it publicly, it would, he would be better off in that way of knowing that it, you know, wasn't, you know, something, something else. Susan? Yeah. Compassion. Yeah, I good. Compassion. compassion. Okay, good. Yeah. I would say that he was a man of great faith because he, he believed what the angel spoke to him. Yeah. And lived it. Good, good. And I think you had your hand up also. Did, did you still want to go? Yeah, yeah. I would say patience. Okay, patience. Good, good. Everyone here? Yeah. He must have really loved her to, to be willing to, to take that scrutiny and not yeah. shame her. Yeah. That was definitely love. Yeah, you're engaged for a year which is, again, as we know, what that betrothal is all about for you know, the year that basically, if you're going to break it up during that time, it, you have to go through a formal divorce at the time, Jacques. An incredible amount of trust. An incredible amount of trust in God, in the situation, and in her, yeah. Sherry? Sure. Yeah, and that's hard because this whole virgin birth thing haven't, haven't happened before. And so you're thinking there's only, way that, there's only one way this takes place, right? And so again, still loving her to that place to be able to do that. Paul, I think you had your hand up. Same thing, love. I'm sorry? Same thing, love. Yeah, good, good, awesome. Joseph takes a stand for righteousness. He's a just man, and he's also merciful, unwilling to put her to shame. And so, yeah, pretty incredible guy. Again, we know a little about Joseph. He was a carpenter. Uh, his dad's name was uh, Jacob. God knew much more about him. God knew he would trust him to raise his only begotten son. And so my, my second question, it kind of ties in with the first, but what qualifications do you suppose God was looking for and what he used to choose this guy? There would have to be, I mean, to, to be able to, to trust a man with, with that, that's betrothed, and, and he's not going to be able to understand everything. Mary's not going to be able to understand this. And you know, when, when, when she gets the answer from the angel, don't worry, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, that helps out a lot, right? <laughs> right? It's not giving a lot of answer to this whole virgin birth thing that, that this is the first time that's happening in all of that. But what qualifications do you suppose God was looking for? Well, each of those. It's, what I've always found with Joseph in the story is everything that he's asked to do, he immediately does it. Even with go down to Egypt, they woke up early in the morning, it says, and he took them down to Egypt, you know, the, the family down to Egypt in that way. And so it's obedience every single step of the way. He just obeys what God says to do. And uh, I, I, I love that. Premarital pregnancy, a scandal as old as teenage hormones. In Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24, if a young woman who is a virgin, that's who we have here, Mary, is betrothed to a husband, that's who we have here, Mary. And a man finds her in the city and lies with her. Not our situation, right? Basically, she gets raped. Then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death with stones, the young woman because she did not cry out in the city, and the man because he humbled his neighbor's wife. Now, I, I said raped. It's con it was considered rape if she was taken out of town because she could be yelling and screaming for help and nobody would be able to hear her and come there. But if it was in the city, somebody would be able to hear was kind of the, the thought behind that. That law was laid out there. And so with that, a virgin 
that, who is betrothed that comes up pregnant with somebody else because that's the only way a woman could be pregnant, right? They would be stoned to death. That's what's got to be going through Joseph's mind. So add that to the equation of, oh, that's a nice thing that he did for her. Oh, he loved her that much. What's behind it is that was this death penalty of what just took place here. But trusting this angel that's saying, it's something different, can't give you all the details, trusting God, and he decides to do it. We know Joseph had to determine what to do. And in verse 20, Let's read what he does. So the very next verse, in 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. You know what he did? In the midst of all that was going on, he's trying to determine what to do. He decides to sleep on it. One of the hardest things to, to do, right, is to be able to, you know what, I'm going to sleep on this, you know, instead of just be like me sometimes, just get agitated and just start spinning up. And all of a sudden I go to put my head on the pillow and, and my mind is just warring, right? It's just going around and around and around. This happened, the same thing happened to Peter when he was in prison. He was able to sleep in prison, prison even though Herod was going to kill him in the morning. He knew he was going to die in the morning. He's like, yeah, I'm kind of feeling vanished. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to. I'm gonna go sleep early. I think that's good wisdom then. Sleep on it. There's a lot of times where maybe God will give you a dream or maybe you'll just kind of wake up and it's like have an idea. Oh, you know what? It isn't as bad as I thought it was when I went to sleep. I could probably do A, B, or C. And a lot of times we just think our mind worked in that way and we got it. And I wonder how many of those times was the Lord giving us the answer that just because it wasn't, you know, an angel at the foot of your bed going, hey, guess what? You know, that, that all of a sudden he gave us the answer and we were able to sleep on it. Not that sleeping on it just works, but giving God that time to be able to speak to your heart, I guess is what I'm saying. So whose child is this? Well, so far it's, it's Joseph's uh, uh, foster child. Secondly, it is Mary's child. There are other stranger ways people came into the world. Think about it. Adam, he was born of dirt. God the Father uh, uh, helps him by breathing life into him. So that was an odd birth, right? The very first birth that we have in Scripture. Uh, Eve, made, uh, made from a rib bone of Adam. That one's kind of strange, with God the Father's surgical help. And then Jesus, conceived in a woman's womb, but with the Holy Spirit's help. And so Adam, Eve, Jesus, there's been some uh, very uh, unusual, supernatural births that have taken place. The miracle of the virgin birth was not the actual birth. We call it the virgin birth. It's actually the, uh, 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 excuse me, the, uh, not just the, it's not the, the birth itself, but it's actually the conception. That's, that's what was supernatural. That's actually what the, the miracle was, how she conceived. This conception was not only supernatural, but unique also, for God had already performed supernatural births for Sarah, Hannah, Elizabeth, and others that are named in Scripture, where uh, God showing his strength by um, getting women pregnant that, that couldn't get pregnant before, and so able to do that. But this one was unique from any other one. The son of the Most High God, umbilically, umbilically tied to a lowly Jewish girl. So whose child is this? Well, it's Joseph's foster child, but it's also Mary's child. And the third one, it's God's peace child. One person said it this way. The father was the author of Christmas for God so loved that he gave. He did the giving. The son was the star of Christmas, his only begotten son. And the world was the recipients of Christmas, for he so loved the world, us. Charles Wesley sang about this birth, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. That's one where we can sing, it comes flowing off our lips, we can sing it every year, but you really have to slow down and veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. You're able to see, see God without seeing God because he's veiled by the skin of flesh. What you're looking at looks so human because it is human, 100% human, but it's also 100% God. That's what you can't see, right? That, that's basically what uh, Charles Wesley was saying. Hail the incarnate deity. It's God, deity, become flesh, incarnate. So the son of God becomes the son of man by a real human birth. He becomes a member of our race as well as the creator of our race. The unseen becomes seen, God emerges from heavenly hiddenness into earthly visibility. 
his incomprehensible someone, the, excuse me, the incomprehensible someone becomes the approachable, touchable, understandable Jesus. We say it's God with flesh on. The creator becomes savior, the greatest fact of all. Whose child is this? Well, it's Jesus' foster child. It's Mary's child. It's God's peace child. And thus he is. All right, so we're going to get into next. What, what child is this? We talked about whose child is it. Now, what child is this? And I'm going to read verses uh, 18 through 24. In verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, so again, legally pledged to be married, to Joseph, before they came together, so they hadn't had any sexual relations, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her, excuse, in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, speaking about Isaiah. In verse 23, he quotes Isaiah, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That'll be our Sunday's message. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. See, as soon as he gets up, does what he's supposed to, right? Took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So they had children later, and, uh, but it uh, wasn't until after Jesus was born where they have relations in that way. This is uh, God in utero, in the womb. God in the womb via the Holy Spirit which leads us right to the first of three names that are given here, Emmanuel, Jesus, and Christ, these uh, names and titles that are given here. Emmanuel is his descriptive name, a descriptive title of his earthly ministry, that he's simply God, not simply, it's profoundly, but, but God with us, right? And so with that, Jesus is still with us. There's no temporary thing here, God with us. He's with us still today. He was with us in the sense of coming to earth in that way, but by sending the Holy Spirit back, he's with us in that he's present with us today, always with us. He promised, that's his promise to us. The second one is Jesus, which is his human name. Of course, we know from going through Joshua that we have, that's the Greek form of the Hebrew, uh, Mashiach or Messiah, excuse me, I jumped in my notes, uh, Yeshua or Joshua, very popular name at the time, and meant Jehovah is salvation. And so by choosing this name, again, very strange for all of their neighbors and everyone, you're going to call them what? There's no, you don't have a Joshua in your, in, your, in your family lineage or in the recent family lineage that you would name them after. So that's strange. But again, using this title here, it means Jehovah is salvation. That God, he's a God, the God of the salvation. And then Christ is uh, an official title, really not a name, it's a title. The Greek form of the Hebrew, Mashiach or Messiah from the Old Testament, we have the New He's the anointed one. And in the, in the Old Testament, the, they would be anointing three groups of people. You would hear the, for, uh, you know, first, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, um, but prophets, priests, and kings. Those are the ones that were anointed, and he's called the anointed. He's called the Christ, the anointed one, and really anointed as all three of those, prophet, priest, and, and king. And his name, Jesus, also defines why he came, for he will save his people from their sins. Our sin has this threefold uh, repercussion. First of all, it affects our, our, our very nature, down to the core of who we are, right? We're born DOA. We're born dead on arrival. Our spirit is laying dormant. And in, in Ephesians 2, it talks about being made alive when we become born again. And so you're, you have your body, your soul, but your spirit's just laying there dead, really, until you come to a relationship with Christ. And until his spirit, by the Holy Spirit, and your spirit is connected together that way, that's what makes us alive or born the second time or born again. And so with it, what happens is this sin that's passed on from our parents to us, it affects our very nature. The nature we're born with is 
enmity or actively opposed towards God. Our fallen nature in no way wants to do what God wants us to do. It wants us to do what we want it to do, right? It's our, it's our flesh. That is our nature, and that's what we want to follow after. Matter of fact, that's our, really our only choice until he gives us a different nature. We still have our old nature, but he gives us a new nature, right? And his righteousness and all that that comes with that. And of course, those two war against each other until, you know, from the day we're saved until the day we get home. But, but ultimately, that's what's happening there. And with this nature, it was Albert Einstein that said, it is easier to denature plutonium than to denature the evil spirit of man. Great point. Secondly, it affects our state or our condition that we're in. The state we're born in is in the, uh, is the absence of righteousness, the absence of righteousness, and that's why he makes us right and gives us his righteousness because we can't do enough good deeds to make up for our bad deeds, and it's just, it just doesn't work that way. Thirdly, I got an amen in the back. It affects our actions. It affects our actions. Our actions become proof of our fallen nature and state when we violate or disobey the revealed will of God. So that's our, the sin. A lot of times we're thinking of our sin. Um, I stole a piece of bubble gum when I was in sixth grade. You know, that kind of, the, the actions that we took, all that is those sins, because really he died for your sin, singular, and sins, plural. You have to note in the New Testament when you see it that way, that he died to take away our sin. That's that sin nature, the base core of all of that. Because if he just took away our sins at that moment, like I got saved at age 19, if on that day, that first Sunday of August that I got saved, boom, he takes away my sins. Well, I got to keep getting saved every day because I'm going to keep sinning in that way if he's only taking away my sins that I committed. But the key was to deal with the nature part of that, give me a new nature in that and take away all of my sin completely in that way. So our actions become proof of our fallen nature and state when we violate or disobey the revealed will of God. If you haven't let go of your sins, you're holding on to, as one put it, a hand grenade with a pin pulled. That's every unbeliever is walking around like that, saying, I can hold it. I can hold it in. I can hold it in. I can hold it in. As soon as you let it go and try to re-grasp it, that doesn't work. Get rid of it as fast as you can, but you can't. You know, that's, that's a good analogy, I think, of... Uh, Letting go of our, if you haven't let go of your sins, that's, that's the situation. All right. Let's look at our, uh, let's look at our Christmas carol or hymn, whatever you want to call it. It's by uh, William Chatterton Dix, D-I-X, uh, was the guy who put this together. And, and um, so just looking at the different, uh, I, I'm just curious of what you see. Maybe you'll find something that, oh, I didn't know it said it that way or it meant it like that. And so we just walk through that. What child is this? He's going to answer it later on uh, it, and, uh, in, in the chorus, but he says, what child is this who laid to rest? N- normally we hear laid to rest and you think of somebody that just died, right? But that's not what it is. Laid to rest. And because there's a pause there, I think we forget, you know, not see it attached to on Mary's lap. He's just resting. So we have a baby on mom's lap. That, that's simply, that's it. And he's sleeping. So we have a baby asleep on Mary's lap whom angels greet with anthems sweet, while shepherds watch are keeping. And he does a great job as naming a lot of the different characters that, that pop up in our story of Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2 of the original story there. Now he's bringing in the angels who appear to the shepherds and, and they're just watching their flock and out there. I, I, was, uh, I shared with one of our, our chapels with the little kids and I had mentioned in that I had just seen that quote that who would be, who is the most excited about a little lamb being born more than a shepherd? And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Okay. Why, lays, why lies he in such mean estate where ox and cattle are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here, the silent world is pleading. What the heck just happened in that, ver- that second verse there? Okay, what's going, on? what's going on with that one right there? What does he mean by mean estate? He's talking about the stable. Okay, humble beginnings, dirty, smelly, you know, yeah. And so he's, he's, they're, they're picturing that, you know, it wasn't in a palace, but he lies in such mean a state where ox and cattle are feeding. So it's just, it's kind of a, a gross scenario. On uh, Friday morning, my newsletter comes out and I kind of wrote about um, 
uh, the, the day, the, the night that I lived in a stable. And so you can read that on Friday. Okay. And so but what about the second part then? Good Christian fear for sinners here. The silent world is pleading. That one took to me the most time. See, he agrees with me. I like that amen in the back. You're getting Pentecostal in the back back there. That's awesome. You know, guys, I, I'm really good. I, I'm just playing. Yeah. I don't want you to go running out or something like that. He's because. I read this. In the midst of some pretty severe mean estate, even so, the silent word was pleading. Pleading with us, pleading for us, pleading that we would slow down and reflect enough to hear the silent word, the very presence of God with us in the midst of mean estate. That's what one person said about it. So basically what it is, good Christian fear, have reverence for the sinners, not here listening, but the sinners here that we're trying to reach the silent world is pleading. The silent word is is pleading, and so it's it's. Can, can you hear that 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 silent whisper of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit to 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 you and I that are believers now, but we have a whole world out there that is going to hell without them, and so with that of this this aspect of reaching out to them. And, and also for us, listening to that silent word, pleading. And, then I, and then I think the plead is, listen, slow down enough to, to, to hear from your God. Not only for the unbelievers, but I think for us also of, of, of hearing him in, in, the, in the midst of that, that quietness. The chorus now answers, what child is this? this? This is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard, angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud. What does laud mean? It's an old English word. Praise, exactly. Uh, and so haste, haste to bring him praise, the babe, the son of Mary. Verse three, so bring him incense, gold and myrrh. So now we bring in the, uh, uh, the uh, magi, come peasant king to own him. Uh, they were, you know, they were called the kings of the east. And so it's not speaking about him being a peasant, but those guys bringing these gifts to him. The king of kings, kind of looking out in the future, this little baby, the king of kings, salvation brings the love, loving hearts enthrone him. Worship team, let's come on up. While they're coming up, I'm going to just throw out uh, something just really practical. How are we doing on time here? Oh, it's time to wrap up. Just a few thoughts. Getting together with family, maybe extended family, maybe a few things you can do. Simple, maybe simple as this, sitting down at whatever meal you're going to have with them. And just talk around the table of what is your favorite character of the Christmas story and why. If they know the Christmas story, if they don't, maybe it's reading part of Matthew 1 and 2 or Luke 1 and 2 and maybe a portion of that. Take turns reading it. Um, just have everyone say what, what Christmas means to them, whether they're saved or not saved. What does Christmas mean to you? Why is it a special holiday to you? And, and hear that. And uh, um, maybe you get to uh, have the honor of uh, praying for the family meal. And so it's little ways in which we can maybe reach out if you're getting together with extended family who might not know the Lord. If everybody knows the Lord, <laughs> great. Have them read the, the, the story together and, and uh, go through that. Let's all stand together for our last song and hopefully thank uh, about what we're Actually, uh, I'll keep talking. Uh, no, what we're, at, you know, what we're singing to him about what we're, you know, really saying and meaning from our uh, from our hearts. 